Now we'll move on to the next topic under partnership act, which is dissolution of firm. What is dissolution of a firm? Dissolution means bringing end. So this is an end to the firm. They are no more continuing as a partners. Every partner in the firm are bound by partnership agreement, right? They are bound by certain relationship. Now they do not want to continue that relationship and all the partners want to bring an end to that relationship. That is called as dissolution of a firm. So don't get with the, confused with the dissolution of partnership. What is partnership if it is only partnership? I'll give you an example and I'll try to explain you this. There are again, we'll take three partners in a firm. A, B and C. Now this person A, he is retiring from the firm. So he ceases to be a partner. This particular thing is called dissolution of partnership. Partnership means relationship of, uh, with each other. A partners, whatever the relationship they have with each other is called partnership. Here we are talking about dissolution of the firm. I give you an example. Again, there are three partners in the firm A, B and C. Now they do not want to continue this partnership firm and they want to bring an end to this firm. It is called dissolution of the firm. The rights and liabilities towards each other is ceased. They are no more continuing as a partner. Here all the partner ceases to be a partner of the firm and they do not have rights and liabilities towards each other. It is called dissolution of a firm. Remember it is dissolution of a firm. The firm itself is dissolved. There are no partners in the firm at all now. Okay, section 39 gives you the modes of dissolution. It, it tells you about dissolution of a firm. Section 39 tells you about dissolution of a firm. And now it also gives you the modes. What are the modes? There are basically five modes. The first one is by agreement. Agreement is given under section 40 of partnership, Indian Partnership Act. Second one is compulsory dissolution that is given under section 41 of the act. The third one is on happening of certain contingencies or certain events that is under section 42. The next one is by notice under section 43. The last one is by the code that is under section 44. So these are the modes of dissolution of a firm. Now let's go one by one and let's try to know what are the uh, different modes. By agreement, section 40, very simple. It says that there should be a consent of all the parties. Oh, sorry, of all the partners. All the partners have to give their consent that yes, we are going to dissolve the firm. Then the firm stands dissolved. Or by contract, if there is anything in contract, if there is any uh, mention, they, they, they do mention about anything about the dissolution, how the firm will come to end in a contract, then as per that, the firm stands dissolved. So by agreement means the first thing that has to come to your mind is it is either by consent of all the parties or the contract between the parties. For example, if there is any contract, they say that after uh, five years, we will uh, uh, dissolve this firm then they can dissolve this firm or else if they say there is a contract between the firm which requires that six months notice is required to dissolve a firm so once a notice is given the, regarding the dissolution of a firm the firm stands dissolved so this is your agreement which is given under section 40 the next part is compulsory dissolution that is given under section 41 it says that uh, when, when it is adjudicated that all partners or all except one partner is adjudicated as insolvent. The first uh, uh, clause under sub, uh, sorry, first subsection under section 41 says that if all the partners or all except one partner is adjudicated as insolvent, then the partnership stands dissolved. But this particular uh, subsection has been omitted. It has been omitted by Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code 2016. Yeah, this is no more into existence. So this subsection is no more into the existence. What does the next point say? When lawful to unlawful. So when the business subsequently started, it was lawful. 
then later on subsequently sorry uh, it becomes unlawful when the business was started it is lawful subsequently it becomes unlawful that is what he, uh, here it is given then the firm stands dissolved now the question may come to your mind can you please give me certain example to say say that when the business was started it was lawful and later on it became uh, uh, un uh, sorry unlawful the best example for this is there are few person they come together uh, as a partner and they start the business of selling liquor so they have come together four persons have come together they have started selling liquor the business is basically selling liquor in a particular area so that is a lawful thing subsequently what happens the government imposes ban on selling the liquor and they said you are not supposed to sell the liquor in this particular area then what happens doesn't it become unlawful if they are still selling in that particular area doesn't it become unlawful yes it becomes unlawful and automatically that particular firm stand dissolved under section 41 of indian partnership act that is compulsory dissolution when though they do not want to dissolve it but under certain circumstances they have to dissolve so first one this adjudicated have or that all the partners are all except one of the partner uh, becomes uh, no has been adjudicated as insolvent is been omitted this only this thing is valid that is when a lawful uh, business when started subsequently becomes unlawful it uh, amounts to the dissolution of the firm also not only this there can be compulsory dissolution on some uh, events like if there is uh, some war between two trading countries some two trading countries a and b there is some transaction going on with, by, by the partnership and they are dependent on it only and there is certain uh, suddenly a war declared so that particular firm automatically stands dissolved so whenever when you are studying about compulsory dissolution under section 41 do remember when anything any firm is created which is against the public policy then the firm stands dissolved under section 41 so compulsory dissolution in spite if even if they do not want to dissolve the company circumstances is created in such a way that their firm stands dissolved i hope so i hope you are clear with this the next one is all happening of certain contingencies that is given under section 42 of indian partnership act basically it is happening on certain event now what are those events that is only given under section 42 it says that on expiration of partnership term suppose the partnership is uh, entered they say that we will uh, do this partnership for uh, for 5 uh, years and 5 years term is over on expiration of that term automatically it stands dissolved second one is completion of adventure we have already studied this upon completion of adventure for example they are into making some movies Person, there are a number of persons who have entered uh, into a partnership uh, agreement that we will be partners till the completion of this movie so the movie takes long, some period of time right so till the movie is completed they become partner and automatically when the movie is completed their partnership stands dissolved the firm stands dissolved the third one is upon death death of a partner as i told you if there is no uh, agreement uh, that even after the death uh, the partnership can continue upon death of any of the partner it comes to an end and also one more requirement i have told you that there should be at least two partners uh, suppose if there are only two partners a and b in the firm and uh, if the if partner a dies partner b alone cannot run the firm at least two members have to be there that is also one point and also upon death of a partner or uh, the partnership firm dissolves but if there is any agreement to the contrary that no you can continue the business then the business can continue i mean the firm can continue then insolvency of a partner if, uh, if there are only two partners one becomes insolvent 
can other be a partner can have can it be called a partnership firm you cannot call it as a car partnership firm so these are certain events or contingency under which on happening of which there is dissolution of the firm one uh, small case law for this is commissioner of it versus a covendra in this case a very uh, interesting case what happens in the year 1943 there are two partners a and b uh, they enter into a partnership agreement uh, to work for a sugar mill something related to sugar and when they entered into the partnership agreement they also made one agreement saying that on the death of either partners the firm should not be dissolved but the legal heir or nominee of the deceased should take their place means if any person dies that is two there are two partners if any one of the partner dies the firm should not be dissolved and that person's place person who has passed away his place has to be taken by a uh, legal heir or any nominee of the deceased person so this was the agreement made in the year 1943 and uh, partner a dies in the year 1945 after the agreement and they were doing the business and partner uh, a dies in the year 1945 it was held that on a's death the original partnership had come to an end the original partnership constituted whom a and b so it has come to an end and the same partnership cannot be continued with a's widow or a's children so it is totally a different agreement now from whatever a and b uh, has in the original agreement is between a and b now if a has died the same uh, no agreement cannot exist between a's representatives so there uh, this particular old partnership is gone and it cannot be a continuance of the old partners or the old partnership agreement it has completely gone that is what is given under this case so whatever we studied here on happening of certain contingency and upon the death the partnership dissolved or uh, if anything agreement is made contrary then it can continue but upon the death of a person it is the original agreement is gone and the new one comes into its place yes next by notice so as soon as me hear the word notice the first thing to come into our mind should be partnership act will it is given under section 7 of indian partnership act so by notice we have been studying by giving a notice that the person is retiring then he can retire by giving a notice that yes the firm will be dissolved uh, with an intention of uh, getting the firm dissolved to all the partners then the firm also gets dissolved clear even in case of uh, if a person wants to uh, retire also he has to give a notice and in case if he wants to dissolve the partnership firm also he has to give a notice the notice should be clearly communicated to all the partners if section 43 says that section 43 says that the firm stands dissolved as on the date mentioned in the notice whatever the no, no, the notice states the date it gives the date of dissolution has on it says the notice says that on this particular date the firm should stand dissolved and that notice should be given to all on that particular date the no uh, the firm stands dissolved if at all no date is given then what is the situation if no date is given the date of dissolution is taken has date of communication of notice that is given under section 43 Now the last part is by the court. It is given under section forty-four. What is it by the court? So yes, given the dissolution, these are all these particular one, two, three, four can be called as voluntary dissolution, whereas this is by court. Anyways, now by court it is given under section forty-four of Indian Partnership Act. So the suit for dissolution of a firm. can be filed uh, by an innocent partner and not the partner whose conduct is subject for the make of the suit that is innocent partner can file a uh, no uh, uh, you know file a uh, file in the court for dissolution of uh, a firm and not the person because of whom 
this particular resolution is adopted by the rest of the partners. So only innocent partners can file the case. So there are certain uh, you know situations which are listed under section 44 where a innocent partner can file for dissolution. When are those? The first one is unsoundness of a mind. So when a partner becomes unsound mind, then on behalf of a person who has become an unsound mind or any other partners in the firm can file for the dissolution of the firm. Clear with this? Unsoundness of the mind. Second one is permanent incapacity to perform duties. If at all there is a permanent incapacity by any one of the partner to perform the duties as a partner, then there can, there can be, they can approach the court for the dissolution of a firm. So that, that capacity should be permanent in nature. Remember, what is it? It says a permanent capacity. If at all it is not permanent in nature, then it, the court won't grant for dissolution. We have a case law for this, the white well versus author. In this case, one of the partners suffered from paralytic attack. He had a paralysis attack and thereby uh, uh, the, the other partner said that he cannot perform. He, he is not able to perform his duties as a partner. One person goes and approaches the court for one partner goes and approaches the court saying that he has got this problem and he cannot act as a partner and he requests for dissolution of the firm. It was held that during the medical evidence the incapacity was not likely to be permanent in nature and the health of the partner who had a paralytic attack was improving. So, since it was not permanent, it was temporary in nature, the court here did not grant dissolution of the firm. So, the whatever the reasons are given, it should be permanent incapacity, not a temporary one. The next one is injurious. If the conduct injurious to the partnership firm, the conduct uh, injurious to the partnership firm, when a partner is found guilty, of conduct which is likely to prejudicially affect the carrying on of the business of the firm, the court may grant dissolution. We okay, can give a best example for this is conviction for breach of trust. If there is any breach of trust by one of the partner, then the court can grant dissolution under conduct injurious to the partnership firm. The next one is persistent breach of partnership agreement so when a partner commits breach of agreements that is relating to the affairs of the company if any breach is made that is relating to the affairs of the company or if a partner any partner conduct himself has not to carry on the business reasonably then the suit for persistent breach can be uh, applied. That is, they can go for dissolution of the firm under persistent age. He, the partner has to do anything for the improvement of business, right? The business of the firm. Or else he has to act reasonably so that there is an advantage to the firm. If at all he is doing continuous breach, then they can go approach the court asking for dissolution. That is, the innocent partners can go and approach. The next one is transfer of whole interest of partnership uh, in the sense transfer of whole of partnership interest to be more clear so when a partner when one one of the partner has transferred the whole interest uh, in the firm to the third party that can also be a ground for dissolution whatever the partnership is interest is there he is giving to the third party then even third party is going to interfere right so that time the other, the other partner can go approach the court asking for dissolution and also the position of the partner is similar when he has allowed his share of partnership to be charged under the provisions of CPC that is Civil, uh, civil Procedure Code and or has allowed it to be sold whatever interest he has got is allowed it to be sold 
in recovery of some uh, land uh, arrears of land revenue or any dues as land revenue under all the circumstances the other partner can go approach the court for dissolution under transfer of all partnership interest so here the important point to be noted is here what did i say whole interest it is not partial interest or part of it it should be whole interest when the whole interest is transferred then the dissolution can be approached and this can be filed by a person only a part by a partner who is innocent and not by the partner who has transferred the interest whose interest has been transferred he cannot file it it is only the other partner can file it that is innocent partner then the next one is loss why is this partnership firm uh, you know started it is for gaining profit we studied in the definition part itself it is for making gains so if there is no gain at all and if there is a continuous loss then also the firm can be dissolved by approaching the court under section 44 when the dissolution is just and equitable apart from all this grounds which are given under section 44 if the court finds that yes it is just and equitable for uh, no dissol dissolving a firm then that court can go proceed and dissolve the firm also if at all if there is any agreement made by the partners that for dissolution of a firm they going to appoint an arbitrator and the person who has been appointed as an arbitrator has got all the power and the firm may also be dissolved by his order clear with this so this is about dissolution of a firm so basically what are the different modes of dissolution by agreement compulsory dissolution and happening of certain contingencies notice and by court it is given from section 40 to 44 The last part under Indian Partnership Act is the registration of the firm. The chapter seven, section fifty-six to seventy-one, deals with the registration of firms. So, however, registration of firm is not necessary in India. So, it is not made compulsory, nor it does not impose any penalties. or uh, if there uh, they won't be liable for anything but there is one section that is section 69 which provides certain disabilities for the unregistered firm they have introduced the section section 69 speaks about the effects of non registration so it has provided certain disabilities and by those disabilities an unregistered firm has to suffer some losses so that is what is given under section 69 simple yes now we'll proceed first one is the procedure the procedure is given under section 58 and 59 of indian partnership act it says that how do you register a firm in order to get your firm registered you have to submit to a person called registrar of firms there is a person called as registrar of firms for that person you have to submit a statement in prescribed form they have prescribed certain form you have to submit a statement in a prescribed form along with the prescribed fee saying that i want to register my firm and that person whom i spoke that is the registrar of the firm he is appointed by the state government and also the state government defines the area that is the limit of his powers where he can exercise his powers and where he can perform his duties so all the powers and the duties and the responsibilities are basically given to the registrar of firms by the state government okay now coming back once the firm the partners give the form that is in a prescribed form that and also some relating documents and agreement saying that yes we have formed a partnership firm and we are producing the uh, form 
what is prescribed by uh, you with certain prescribed fees and when the registrar is convinced that and satisfied that yes they have complied all the conditions then the firm gets registered now let's see what is the those application has to contain what i said they have to give certain form there is there is also an application for that so what should that application contain so those application should contain it must state point number 1 there should be firm name firm name is very important right so whatever is a firm name the firm name should be stated in that second point it should give the place or principal place of business of the firm where and in which place or where is the principal that is head office of the firm that has to be mentioned point number 3 if at all they are carrying on the business elsewhere also the place and address of all those places has to be given where it is carrying on the business next the date of partners joining the firm if at all partner yes the partners obviously they are going to join there would be a new partner right coming in and also going out all of uh, here when we are they are going out for a procedure uh, uh, when when they are filing an application at which day did the partners join the firm even those has to be mentioned when you are speaking about the partners you have to give their name and full address also right yes the four, fifth point is the names and the full address of the partners then the last point that is the sixth point the duration of the firm if at all they have agreed that they will be for performing for this duration the duration of the firm has to be given so these are the things which are required to be mentioned in the application that is going to be submitted to the registrar of the firms clear these are the basic procedures which are will be laid out under section 58 and 59 and this particular application and all, all other statement and documents have to be signed by the partners in fact all the partner cannot come and sign then he has to authorize a special agent for this in this case an agent should be specially appointed for this purpose and he has to be given the powers that on uh, on behalf of the partner he is signing the documents and getting the firm registered under indian partnership act clear so there is uh, no separate uh, registration necessary in case of reconstitution of a firm only intimation is enough uh, that uh, to the register under section 60 to 67 it is mentioned not necessary that they have to register it again you give an intimation to the register that is enough that works and also this particular partnership it is not necessary that once they form a partnership firm they have to get registered not necessary in companies and all they get registered but in partnership firm not necessary they can register whenever they are willing to it is not that today they have formed a partnership firm and they have to go today and they have to uh, register no under this act it is not compulsory they can register their will clear so one more point uh, in the procedure to be noted here is the firm's name whatever the firm name they have they should they should not contain the following what are those words that is crown emperor impress imperial king queen royal or any words which express or expressingly or implyingly it mentions that it is related to government or sanction anything Um, in the sense it should not contain the firm's name should not have these words whatever i have listed that shows that they belong to state government they have some uh, state government or a government that they have certain relationship with the government it should not signify that they are they that they are tied up uh, with the government they are separately formed for running the business and uh, making profit and that profit is utilized by them they are not going to share with the government right so they should not use the words which signifies that they are with the government that's all 
it, all these conditions whatever I have stated is fulfilled and the registrar is satisfied by all the thing, all the documents which are produced by the um, partnership firm then he can register it in the registrar, register they have a register there the registrar is the person who is registering they have a register wherein all the details are been recorded so they can register it after all the conditions are fulfilled i hope you are clear with the procedure which is laid down under section 58 and 59 now the next part okay finally the registration is done and if there are any subsequent changes and alterations to be made that can also be made and that is discussed from section 68 to 65 what are those? The first one is name and principal place. If there are any changes to be or alterations to be made with regard to the name and principal place. That's given under section 60. How can they do it? Yes, section 60 is from that. Yes, the alteration can be made uh, relating to the name, firm's name. I'm talking about firm's name here. First one is firm's name. Do you remember? It is firm's name and principal place of business they can make it they can make a changes by how a statement has to be sent to the register with the prescribed uh, fees specifying the alteration and that has to be signed by the partners by all the partners as we have already discussed under section 58 clear with this so this has to be sent to the register registrar and if the registrar is satisfied that yes all the details are correctly signed and it has been all the documents have been properly provided then if it's satisfied then he'll make an entry in the register clear with this okay the second one is noting of closing and opening of closing uh, closing and uh, opening of branches that is given under section 61 so, under 61 lays down that if a registered firm discontinues a business in a particular place. Suppose it has got a branches uh, in Belagam and in Bangalore. Now it does not want to continue in Belagam. And it has already registered that it has a place at Belagam. Now it does not want to continue there and if it gives a uh, notice to the register that no we are discontinuing the uh, uh, place in Bel uh, business in Belaga that is accepted and they will make a required changes. If at all they are opening the branches now uh, there was a there is a there is a principal places in Bangalore now they are opening a, a new branch in Darwad. Even that can that has to be uh, whatever it is even if it is opening or closing it the intimation to the register has to be given the third one is change in the name and address of the partners so as we said under procedure the full name and the full address of the uh, uh, partners has to be given if at all there is any change in the partners name or uh, permanent address of the partners again it has the notification has to be given to whom the register to make the changes. Next point. Change in constitution of the firm or dissolution of the firm. If there is any change in the constitution of a firm. How there is a change in the constitution of the firm? I have already discussed, right? That is either by introduction of a new partner or if a partner ceases to be a partner on retirement, expulsion, insolvency or death. So there is a change and there is a constitution of a firm. Since the constitution of a firm. So what has to be done? It has the no, registrar has to be notified about it. Clear? Yeah? In case of dissolution also, dissolution also, notice has to be given to the registrar that yes, this particular firm is getting dissolved as on this date. Then the registrar is going to enter this in this register. Clear yeah, with this? So in case of retirement, expulsion of a partner or dissolution what has to be given i have told you in case of retirement or expulsion or dissolution a public notice has to be given so that the person who is retiring or person who is being expelled can can be, cannot become liable to the third party and also in case of dissolution also plus plus 
when their company is when the, sorry when the firm is registered notice of the register to the register has to be given under section 63 remember public notice plus notice to the register under section 63 then what it comes is one more topic to be noted when we are speaking about constitution of the firm we also spoke about minor right so minor after he attains the age of majority it is his choice either he can elect or he or if he does not want he can say that he does not become to a want to become a partner so it is his choice he has got two options either he can say yes or no to becoming a partner in case he has he wants to become a partner then again here a public notice plus notice to the register has to be given in both the cases he has to give the um, uh, public notice plus a uh, notice to the register here yeah? when you are talking about the constitution of the firm do remember the minor also what happens to a minor then the last uh, that is the fifth point i'm sorry is the rectification of mistakes which is given under section 64 so rectification of mistakes section 64 subsection 1 it gives the power to the registrar that if at all there is any mistake in the register the registrar has a power to rectify those mistakes and bring in conformity with the documents of the firm so whatever is there in the documents of the firm and if at all there is some mistake in the register The, the registrar has got the power to rectify and bring in conformity with the documents of the firm section 64 sub section 2 section 61 the 64 sub section 1 says that bring in conformity with the documents of the firm now section 64 sub section 2 says that application made by all the parties who have signed any documents that is relating to the firm and it is filed the register may rectify the mistake or if in a document or in record or make a note of it he can rectify any document first we spoke about any changes next if at all in any documents there is a change to be made or if at all any change has to be noted and the section 64 section 2 those no those things can be made that is he can make note of it or he can make any changes in the documents we have a case law for this that is durga prasad versus register of firms a very uh, simple case here the notice for dissolution was given by the firm and it was in the year 1961 on 30th august from one of the partners that was duly received by the registrar and it was entered in the register by the registrar that the said partner had retired now it was not because of retirement they dissolved, dissolved the firm for some other purpose and it was stated in the register that it was because the said partner had retired the firm has been dissolved Now the other partner uh, sought uh, to have them rectified. He went to the register and he said that please rectify it. The register did not rectify it, and they approached the court. The court said that, in fact, it advised the uh, register that yes, you have a power under Section sixty four. You please rectify it properly. So under Section sixty four, it gives the power to rectify. any mistakes i hope you are clear with this the next one is amendment of register by order of court that is given under section 65 if there is any dispute in the court and it becomes necessary has a consequence of decision by the court the court gives certain decision and uh, due to that decision has a consequence of that decision the court is asking the registrar to rectify it then the register can has to rectify by the order of court which is given under section 65 the next one is inspection that is given under section 66 and section 67 of the act what it says is section 
It says that the registrar of the firm shall open, shall keep open for the inspection by any person upon payment of fees, prescribed fees. That is, any person can go and inspect the documents relating to the firm on payment of prescribed fees. That is what is given under section 66. And section 67 says that again payment of prescribed fees, certified copies shall be given to the person by the registrar. You pay a certain amount, we will give you the certified copies. So that is about inspection. Next, evidence under section 60. What is this evidence ma'am? Why are you talking about evidence in the registrar of, registration of firms? Yes, section 68 says that whatever the uh, changes that uh, the registrar has made or whatever the uh, no, details they have entered into the registrar that stands as a conclusive proof and you cannot question it. That is a conclusive proof. Any documents, any changes, any note which was made by the registrar and if that certified copy is taken that is considered to be that is enough to prove Whatever relating to that case, it is enough. That is an enough proof. It is a conclusive proof. That is what is given under section 68. Now, as I told you that section 69, it provides certain disability to whom? Unregistered firm. So, section 69 speaks about effect of non-registration. When a firm is not registered, what happens? So, when a partnership firm is not registered, there are partners in the firm. So if at all there is dispute between the partners. There are three partners A, B and C. And if there are, if at all there is any dispute between these partners. One partner cannot sue other partner. That is A partner cannot sue B partner and B partner cannot sue A partner. Same thing with other partner also. So if at all if they are not registered, they cannot sue each other. Or else. It cannot sue the firm also. If at all, one, there are three partners. Let's assume, okay, let's take more number of partners. There are five partners in the firm. Now, all these four partners have committed certain breach. This fifth partner cannot sue the firm. Firm in the sense, the other rest of the partners. So, if at all, if they are unregistered, they are disabled from suing the partners or the firm. Point number one. Is it clear? Okay. The next one is an unregistered firm again uh, cannot file a suit against third party. When there is a partnership firm and they want to do a business for a profit, they obviously enter into co a contract with the third parties, right? So they cannot file a case against the third parties if at all if the third party commits some wrong. Why? Because they are not registered. Also, they cannot claim any set-off and all. If it is unregistered, they cannot claim set-off or else they cannot or for any other proceeding to enforce the right arising out of the contract. If at all, they have to recover certain money or if at all, uh, they have to recover certain goods. Those are the rights, right? Whatever the partnership firm had, since it is unregistered, they cannot enforce that right also. Clear with this? So what are the effects of non-registration? The first effect is the part of the unregistered, the unregistered firm, the par partner cannot sue the firm, not the, not the partners, not other partners. They cannot sue the third party. They cannot claim the set off or they cannot file any proceedings to enforce their right, which is arising out of the contract. But there are certain exceptions. This particular section does not apply. In which cases? So, point number one, they do not apply to right to sue for dissolution. When they want for the dissolution, they go, they approach the court. They can go approach the court. If at all, they are not registered also. I have given you the grounds, right? Under which they can file for dissolution. They can go file for dissolution. Or for the accounts of dissolved firm. If at all they require any accounts, they can go approach it even if they are unregistered. 
or to realize the property of dissolved firm whatever the property is being realized of the dissolved firm for that also this particular section does not apply other thing point number 2 or power to realize the property of an insolvent partner in order to realize the property of insolvent you cannot if it is an unregistered you cannot apply this section 69 the other exceptions also that is given under section 69 sub section 4 are other exception apart from the dissolution part and also we talk, we spoke about the insolvent's property the other thing also if the firm is not located in the areas which is or else if it is exempted from the operation or if the uh, act does not apply then obviously this section would be applicable and uh, the last one is if the proceedings are uh, is not exceeding 100 rupees of value then you cannot apply uh, this particular section so there are basically four exceptions the first one spoke about dissolution and the second one spoke about the power to realize the property of an insolvent person and the uh, third one that is third one and fourth one is from the section 69 sub section 4 if it is not located in the area where the act is extended or if it if at all the act is exempted in that particular area then this act this particular section cannot be enforced or if a proceeding it is not exceeding 100 rupees in value so basically what is the effect of non registration elements if at all a plaint filed by an unregistered uh, firm is no is in fact no plaint at all if they are filing any case it is not at all a case clear yeah. so therefore section 69 makes the firm compulsory to register in order to avoid the disabilities which are given under section 69 clear yeah, with us so this is about the registration of the firms so registration is basically 10 in chapter 7 from section 56 to 50 uh, sorry 71 So 69 is very important since it gives you certain disabilities of unregistered firm. That is effects of non-registration of firm. Here, yeah? so there is a register who records everything in the register, and that register is appointed by the state government, and he has been given the power of his and duties by the government. Now let's know the differences between partnership and company and partnership and HUA. There are very limited differences. and very easy also now you can only say what are the differences first one partnership and company company has got a legal entity it is a legal entity which can be different it can be differentiated from its member who constituted but whereas in partners what did we study partner individually they are called partners and together they form a firm do not have separate legal entity clear so company is a legal entity separate legal entity distinct from its members whereas in partnership they are individually they are called partners and together they are called a firm and they have no separate legal entity now coming to company again they have a perpetual succession that is even after the death of a member it still continues the company still continues whereas when you come to a partnership what did i say if there is any death of a partner it can come to an end it may also come to an end but yeah there are, we discussed other condition also unless uh, until there is a contract to the contrary they can continue in that case they can continue. but what is the rule if there is a death of any partner it comes to an end because there is a dislocation of partnership right at the same so it is a it has a perpetual succession it may come to an end upon a death of a person next the shareholder in case of company can transfer a share to anybody he has got certain shares he can transfer it to any anybody right but in case of partnership can they share can they substitute can anyone take the place of the partner no right nobody can take the place of the partner again when you come to the company the legal representatives can come into the can come to the place of a member he can step into the shoes of a partner but in case of partnership can the legal representatives take the place of a partner no it becomes totally a new partnership right when the legal representatives come in discussed it in a case law 
So, in case of company, uh, share, if the shareholder is transferring the shares, then the shareholder, uh, the new member becomes a shareholder of that new of a company. And also, in case of company, the legal representatives step into the shoes of the uh, member. But in case of partnership firm, it does not happen. Nobody can substitute the place of a partner. And again, when you speak about a company, it can be a limited liability. Whereas in partnership, it is unlimited liability. Clear with this? Next, again coming to the uh, difference between, now let's go to the difference between partnership and HUF. HUF is Hindu undivided family. So, part, how do you enter partnership? There should be an agreement. Whereas, do you require agreement for HUF? No, there is no agreement. It is on the status of a person. If a person is born in that Hindu undivided family, he automatically becomes a member of that family. But in the case of partnership, the agreement is required. Next, and a partnership if there is any introduction of a new member. Consent of partners are required, right? Yes. But in case of HUF, Hindu and divided family, no consent is necessary. If by per, if there is a, a person born in this HUF, then he becomes a member of the family. Here, how are they binding? It is by mutual agency that binds the firm. But there is no mutual agency has in HUF. The karta is a person who has got all the powers and he controls everything. Here, when you speak about the liability, it is joint and several, right? Plus, it is also unlimited. But when it comes to the liability of HUF, it is the extent of shares in that particular family. Whatever in the family, whatever the shares a person is having, that extent will be liable. Here, the partnership can be dissolved on the death of a partner. But not in case of HUF. If a person dies in the case of HUF, Still it continues. We have this. So this is about partnership. And one more important point to be noted is under Companies Act, when you speak about the number of members, uh, number of partners in uh, uh, Partnership Act, Section 640, sorry, Section 464, I'm sorry, Section 464 of Companies Act, Recent Companies Act 2013, it says that the limit is 100 whereas again the company rules 2014 gives you that the limit is 50 clear clear with this so this is about the partnership so now we will just have a brief of whatever we have studied in partnership so and a partnership section 4 gave us the definition of a partnership partner firm and firm's name so we had got to know about the definition of partnership so then in the chapter 3 from section 9 to section 17 we studied the relation of a partner to one another that is relation of partners inter se that is one how is one partner related to another partner from section 18 to section 30, we studied relation of partners with third parties. After one partner, one partner to another, of the partners with the third parties, what are their relations? So from section 31 to 38, we studied about incoming and outgoing partners. Then from section 39 to section 55 it gave you the details about dissolution of a firm how can a firm be dissolved what are the modes of dissolution of a firm then in the last chapter that is uh, i mean in chapter 7 we studied about registration of a firm it is not a last chapter i'm sorry chapter 7 it gives uh, gave us the registration of a firm that is from section 56 to 71 the last chapter is a supplemental, it is uh, chapter 8, that is uh, 72, 73 and 74. It gives you some supplementals. That is how the, how do you give notice? We studied under section uh, 72, right? So section 70 is repeat and section 74 is savings. So clear with this? So this is about Indian Partnership Act 1932. I hope you are clear with uh, uh, the Indian Partnership Act. Thank you for patient listening. Thank you all.